I think you told you told me or you you told us that it was uh, uh, you told me that uh, I had to uh, to change something in my life because of my uh, beliefs. But you know, um, you yourself you pray in front of a shrine. There is Ramakrishna. You have a worship. So. You know, uh, even if I uh, believe that my worship uh, in the church is uh, not so good, uh, you don't. Uh, it's you, you, you yourself. It's an example that we need to have to to go to in front of shrines, and uh, we have to worship something, someone, uh, and so on. You know. If if I if I had if I if I had to to give up with my um, worship in the church, uh, I would be nothing. And you 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 give an example that we have to you you in the you and the, the monks of the order of Ramakrishna, maybe. Maybe not all of them, but you go to in front of the shrine, shrine, and you worship Ramakrishna and Sarada Devi. You you, you consider she's a, a God. Uh, she's a, the mother, the holy mother. It's a lot of things. But I'm not sure what your question is. My question is: uh, if I stop. Going to the church, uh, you know, for uh, my uh, own. Uh, I, I I think my my adoration, you know, my worship, is not perfect, because in the church we have to to say uh, um, that we are sinners and so on. So it's sometimes it's difficult with my understanding and uh. my deep belief. Mm. Okay. Okay. I, I, I see you and the the monks. You oh, you you have also a, a, a worship, a formal worship. Well, you, for, well, with your meditation, it's very yeah. Uh, ethereal. Yeah. yeah. So uh, so there's nobody would ever suggest that you give up the structure that you have. In fact, you intensify the structure that you have. So the fundamental thing about worship or books or rituals or any of these things is they are secondary details. They're like building a scaffolding. And building a scaffolding uh, is necessary to build the building. But once the building is done, we can do away with it. So we have to make sure that, you see, at the end of the day, Swami Vivekananda is saying it's good to be born in a church but not to die there church means religion but not to die there meaning that once we have outgrown the scaffolding then we have no use for it however it's not that that's going to happen today or tomorrow you use whatever is useful for you in fact more than that because our goal is so far removed from us for most people then we have to, and it's difficult, then we have to use as many different tools as we possibly can. And they fall into some categories. Now, it's not true that we all go and worship Ram Krishna and all that, because there are some who are non-dualists and they don't do worship at all. Swami Vivekananda made sure that at least some of the ashrams in India were non-dualistic. He went to Mayavati, for example, where he established an Adita Ashram. And he saw a picture of Ramakrishna there and he said, oh, the old man has gotten here as well. And he rebuked the people there for having any image whatsoever because he wanted at least some places to be purely non-dualistic. 
And so there are some who are non-dualistic. And we, if you say the fundamental statement that Swami Vivekananda makes about churches and temples and rituals and books and dogmas and doctrines, he's saying there are secondary details, but he's also saying that there are four principal ways of arriving at our goal by work or worship or psychic control or um, uh, you know, work or worship, psychic control or philosophy, one or more or all of these and be free. Now, in our life, we are not exclusively feeling people or thinking people, so maybe we should have a balance of all of these, but each one has is individually responsible for their expression. And if your expression is there in the church, you should not just continue, you should intensify that. Now, I'll give you an example, and some people here may recall how I used to take people down to Glenstall Abbey, which is near Limerick, about three, four hour drive. And there, part of the retreat was to participate in the liturgy which was going on there. It was a Catholic, Catholic liturgy, because they were all basically Catholics and mostly uh, non-practicing Catholics. And so the effect of that was they saw the deeper dimension, as it were, of their own religion and went back to going to the church. I remarked to the abbot, Benedictine abbot, you have nothing to fear from us. We're taking people back to, your, to the religion. So oftentimes we repeat this mantra to make Christians better Christians, Buddhists are better Buddhists, Hindus are better Hindus, and so on. There's a reason why you are born in the religion or find yourself in a religion, because that is the sweetest avenue for you. And nobody says leave that. But what we say is deepen it. Deepen it. Now, there are some doctrines in, within a religion that are suitable if you're catering for everybody fat, thin, uh, although we can't politically say that now, politically correctness says nobody's fat, they just horizontally challenge. But you see, with all these differences, uh, and if you are a global universal establishment trying to get through to everybody from the age of, let's say, five to the age of 55, then you have to cater for every part of spiritual life, which is the same as physical and mental maturity. That same process is going on. So what happens when we are newly born and don't know any better, we're absorbing all our experiences, then we have to accept what is around us. We can't judge or evaluate anything because we have no experience of it. So we accept everything. Same thing in spiritual life. We accept what is there. But that's a fundamental infant stage of the growth. And we outgrow that also because in our social life, reward and punishment come in. If you don't do this, this will happen. It's a kind of short-term motivation, motivating factor, which is effective in the short term, but not the long term. So. What happens in the long term happens much later in life, when we're not forced to study, when we're not forced to uh, or obliged to obey laws, we take personal responsibility for our development. And in that taking personal responsibility, we then are not uh, forced to study or compete, we voluntarily do it. Seeing another student doing well, we want to do at least as as well, or if not better, there's a drive for perfection in all of us. All of us have some kind of inner drive toward perfection, and that is biologically true of every organism. So we do it in biological terms through natural selection, but this drive urges us to nobler, nobler heights. How we do it must be entirely different because for each one, because we're all constitutionally different. You can't fit everybody into the same framework. 
8 billion people on the planet should have 8 billion religions. That's the fact of it. So we have no argument with having any different method. The whole basis of our movement is this freedom of expression, which comes out as harmony of religions. And this is a unique contribution to the world to say all paths are true. Either all religions are true or they're all false. So you select your path and your chosen ideal that is most suitable for you individually, and you progress, and many aspects of it you will outgrow. Dogma and doctrine comes in in the legalistic part of that growth. When we are told you should do this and not do that. If you do this, there's a consequence. If you do that, there's a consequence. But when we mature and start a different phase, different phase means we take on individual responsibility, we embark on spiritual life, then religion starts. Religion starts not from the outside, religion starts with the commencement of the mystic journey, a journey that is all within and it's to do with internal discovery. And God then gets taken out of the extra, extra cosmic realm and gets put into the inner sanctum of the heart. At that point, spirituality commences. So nobody ever says, stop what you're doing. But everybody says, intensify what you're doing. And when you intensify, what happens? There's an inner awakening that also happens progressively. And the inner awakening becomes a revealing thing, like looking at a, a garden behind, from behind a wall where only a keyhole is visible. And we peek through it and we see a glory of a garden, but we can't see the totality of it. So then what do we want to do? We would like a larger keyhole, but that's not available to us. So we try to find how can we open the door. When we open the door, the door has had its use. The keyhole is no longer relevant because we're able to see firsthand for ourselves. The only evidence, the only proof is direct evidence, direct proof for ourselves. And we all come to the same conclusion. If we all come to the same unity of understanding, then how we got there becomes irrelevant. If you're looking to explore that garden in this analogy, then there may be many doors. And when we all go into the garden, we may inquire, which door did you come through? I came through that one on the corner. And you, I came from that one on the other corner. All right, you can't say my door was better. You arrived at the same place. So that's the idea. When people understand it, then all warfare and antagonism will stop which is there on the basis of, um, which is there on the on the basis of uh, religion or methodology? That's all gone. Yeah. Does that make it clear? Yes. 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 But just, yes. But when when you say nothing, nothing comes from uh, outside. It's yes. you know if I if I go to the church, I'm waiting for something which comes from outside. So yes. I should not go there. I should find it in myself with uh, like you 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 do. Yes, but, uh, but, so, but you see, but you see, every temple and church is designed to lead you on the inner journey. You may be using external clues and triggers and. Uh, artifacts that lead you on the way. You may be constructing a path. For example, in a church, if you see a central feature and there's a symbol that there's a living presence there, like a lamp, it reminds you that unseen, there's something inside something and is represented as the Jewish tent, elaborated tent, tabernacle. And within that, we understand a living presence is there, like a kind of inner chamber in a palace. And much worship is along these lines. In Hindu temples, it's the same thing. Hindu temples are called mandir, coming mm. from the same root manas, meaning 
This is a help for meditation using an external building or external sacred place or going on a pilgrimage. All of these are various structural means. But at the end of your pilgrimage, what will you find? I think it is Rumi or one of the Sufi poets said, I look for God in a temple or a church. I look for him in the mountains. I look for him on pilgrimages. I look for him everywhere. And then I discovered wherever I went, I was carrying him with me. For that being is within me. And so that withinness is the mystic journey. You can do it in a church. It's a better environment to do it. So that when you take, uh, let us say, let us use the Catholic uh, uh, ritualistic uh, uh, process of communion. There's a reason why they call it communion. Communion means yoga. Communion means a mystic union. What does it mean? After all the ritualism, from scriptural reading up to a kind of puja in the Hindu language, what will you come across? An opportunity for you to sit with that sacred sacrament inside you and then to have an intimate discourse, an intimate junction, a communion with this. That's, mm. that's the culmination of it. It becomes, right. it becomes personal, it becomes intimate, it becomes internal. I have some progress to do. I must, I must improve myself. Still. Join, join the human race. <laughs> <laughs> See, we're all in the same boat. We're all on the same pilgrim journey. And constitutionally, we are different. And constitutionally, we'll have to take a different journey, a different path. There's no doubt that's necessary. Hi, Swami. I do uh, have a question. Yes, yes. How can we stop avoiding conflict? And with conflict, I mean, sometimes you need to speak up when something is not right. And it can feel very hard to confront someone. And this is something I realize I've been struggling with lately, which I've been trying to work on, which is to speak and open up. Because I realize when you actually confront and you say, for example, what an action made you feel, that liberates you. Um, but it's sometimes very, it's very tough. So it's not that you want to get into a fight or something, but um, just like a normal conflict of uh, of a day to day. Because um, yes, you you can see God in that person and so on, but still you're in this game, and still you're put in a test from yourself and others and I just found that I I actually struggle a lot with conflicts and I want to stop having a problem with it because this there's no issue with it there's only an issue when you know it gets into something aggressive or or so well there's well, one Sorry, can I can I add to that? Um, yes, yes. Because you, you um, that's a great question. Um, and I suppose to add to that question, how do you, if you don't feel that you have the vocabulary or that sense of calmness to communicate this potential conflict? Um, that unfortunately you end up reacting rather than responding in a very calm way to, to stay in the moment 
Because if I could approach conflict in a very calm way, I don't think I'd run away from it as much as I do. Sorry, just to add to that question. Mm -hmm. Well, we have to, firstly, we have to change our language. The word conflict may not be necessary. And if we change our language, then we can shift our approach to it, and then shift our thinking on it. Our evaluation of it becomes different. And that in turn depends on the evaluation of the situation and evaluation of life itself. So that's the first thing. There's a rule, and that is we should take always take the non-competitive gap. The non-competitive gap is the easiest way around. We don't have to compete at every given stage. So conflict arises firstly within ourselves within our own mind because we haven't defined conflict what kind of conflict we have a conflict firstly within our own minds about various things and part of that conflict is reflected in situations where we are conflicted there, Marina's point may well be that there is a, a situations where things are clearly wrong. And perhaps we have to stand up and point it out. So when we do this, we have to always be aware that there's only one thing and that is called spirit. When we see it all divided up like this, we forget it. And part of that is our own egoism. So our own egoism is also part of that split up situation. Now you see, what circumstances would we find ourselves in where we'd have to uh, correct a situation and be calm about doing it if you ask that question, you have never studied the Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita is a clear example of how to handle this. And there are 18 chapters dedicated to this. First chapter is laying out the situation and saying, we've come to a conclusion. Our formula for avoiding this conflict will be, we're going to withdraw and allow the other not only withdraw, we're going to lay down all our arms, all our equipment, and we're going to allow the other side to step over us and perhaps kill us. And maybe that's better than us killing them. So there's a conflicting situation where I don't know what to do and it's creating acute anxiety in me. And this acute anxiety in me causes confusion. We have to take measures to have a consistent view that always deals with the confusion so that there's no confusion whatsoever everything is clear from the beginning this is why we study philosophy and this is why we practice yoga which is the practical implementation of that philosophy either work or worship or psychic control or you know philosophy one or more all of all of these then be free so we have to practice outside the situation. We have to make sure we have a good storehouse within us that we can draw on so that whatever situation arises, we are automatically calm. Whether it's good, whether it's bad, we're automatically calm. And that comes from changing and shifting our outlook, our evaluation of what's in front. What's in front, our final conclusion is only God is there. Only the spirit is there. Oh, it's only divine. That's all there is. Lack of recognition of this will uh, create a situation for us where the ego becomes paramount or egoism becomes paramount. An egocentric point of view becomes paramount. It's nothing new. We see it in the animal kingdom. You see, I recently saw that in Australia, in the mating season, the normally calm and gentle platypus becomes aggressive and starts fighting with rivals straight away. But if you have no rivals, that's gone. 
then they may be fighting over territory. But if all territory is the Lord's, that's also gone. Or you might be fighting over some kind of situation which you feel is unjust. And then you have to really evaluate what right do you have to make a pronouncement of it. And if it's obviously unjust, then if you cannot change it, you have to use some other means without getting involved. But if you can change it, then you have to do it in a structured way. Why do we study the Enneagram? So that if we're dealing with people, we know how to handle a delicate situation. And we do it with a sense of poise. But above all, we do it seeing the God within. That's the key to it all. We see the divine, see the God within. We have the possibility, we have not, we, not only the possibility, but we have the, uh, oh, the only means is at the, human, at the human level, at the human disposal to transform discord into harmony. Only the humans can do it. So it might be that of all the variety of beans in the world, such as green beans and haricot beans and so on, human beans may be the most difficult, only because they're the most complex. And the complexity is centered around their sense of self, their sense of identity. So we don't deal with everybody in a standard way. The Enneagram teaches us to know how to deal with different people in different situations in such a way that we don't press a reaction trigger, that we get the best for everyone. And everyone includes me, includes the person, includes everybody involved in the situation. So the most important value that we have is love. That's the most important value we have. And in a loving way, we can make a correction. In a loving way, we can enter into a difficult situation and fight the injustice as we find in the Bhagavad Gita. To evaluate everyone, seeing the self in all beings and all beings in the self, we progress and do our duty. It's not about violence. Bhagavad Gita is not about violence. Bhagavad Gita is about duty. What is my spiritual direction? If I'm a military man, then it's military life. If I'm a, uh, an accountant, then it's accountancy. If I'm a, a, a beautician, then it's being a beautician. If it's a student, it's being good in, at studies. So these are all, whatever occupation we find ourselves in, all these occupations are part of spiritual life. This is our fundamental direction. So that is how we handle situation. First of all, change the language. There's no such thing as conflict. There's only such thing as handling something from a mature perspective. And if it's difficult and raises the emotions very quickly, then we have to have the maturity to stand back and reassess the situation nicely. And our final evaluation of the situation will be, it is all God. And therefore, this is all his divine play. Let's enter into it with the sporting attitude. Because anything less than that will create another negativity in us. And it is negativity that we're trying to, uh, we're trying to uh, overwhelm with its opposite. The only remedy is to raise up the opposites not necessarily in the situation there. We have to deal with it as it arises, no doubt. But even before the situation, that means in moments when nothing seems to be happening and when the mind is free to wander wherever it wills, at that moment, we have to capture our attention and steer it, hey, come on, let's steer you to a higher, nobler truth. Let's go to the highest values we can. Let's find God. Let's in every situation and let that inner joy come up and rise up and express itself. So, yeah. 
So there is no such thing as conflict. Let me give you an example of what I mean by that. Supposing you're playing a sport, supposing it's hockey, or currently I suppose it's tennis, I don't know. Whatever it is, there's always somebody on the opposite side. Do you see that it's conflict? Do you take do you be part of a hockey team with another team on the other side and say, we're going to go into conflict? Or do you take a sporting attitude? And we're all equipped to get round situations. So we have no business to complain or fear even. We simply, as much as possible, take the non-competitive gap and go forward, well equipped, put the armor of God on. And you put the armor of God on, you are always protected. All the difficulties or conflicts we have to replace with different language. Instead of saying difficulties and obstacles, we can say fragments. So these are not mistakes, they are fragments. They're not awkward difficulties, they're fragments. And other fragments will be there tomorrow as well, by the way. You're only recognizing the reaction to fear and fighting of, of, of the fragments. You're only uh, recognizing your reaction to fear and you're fighting off the fragments if you take it like that. You're not altering the fragments. They will always beat you if you fight them. So we shouldn't fight them. No conflict. We don't enter into conflict at all. We don't fight them. We don't reject them because they're not a, a danger. So we put in the positive thoughts at the same time and tune in to the totality. Resist ye not evil. Non-resistance. You know, when you learn uh, uh, martial arts, you use the other person's force and you go with it, not resisting it. Resisting it will be more painful and tougher. If a person is attacking you and pushing you, you move backwards, you don't move forward. You move backwards and take the person with you. So these are all fragments. Fragments of what? Seeming fragments of God. We should have no fear about them. It's only that one divine light seemingly split up into rainbow colors, fragmented like that. That's all. So our whole view of the world has to change. There's only conflict when you say, I'm here and something else is there. There's no totality in it. But the reality is a totality. So we have to practice that. Not when the situation arises. But we have to practice that all the time. So that an automatic loving response is there whenever a situation arises anyway. I hope that helps. Thank you, Swamiji. Be a transforming machine that transforms discord into harmony. A flower does it. It takes all the manure and transforms it into a beautiful, sweet smelling flower. It doesn't follow its origin and say, oh, you're demanding that I smell like manure. In this situation, uh, Swami, is it possible to say, with the help of God, is, is, okay. there, is there anybody who, who can help us? So, because, uh, you know, God is inside us, but is there some, 
someone outside who can help us? They, well, uh, am I am I fool? Uh, am I wrong? Uh, I, I I think I don't. Uh, do you think I am? Uh, I'm a fool to think that somebody could help help me or help us. Well, God is both inside and outside, and for a, from a devotee's point of view, yes, God can help you, no doubt. But you see, as we mature, we realize that that God is inside, and if it's inside me, it's inside the situation, and if it's inside the situation, it's inside every other person within the situation. So there's this imminent side which is there. And in the beginning stages, we think that God is outside. It's natural to think that God is outside in the beginning stages. As we develop in our own spiritual life, it becomes more and more interior, and the stages are like this. We first see God outside. Then we see God inside. Then we see God flowing through. And then we see as and beyond. That's the process. Now, there may be a transition period where we think, well, God is outside and inside, that's okay. From God's point of view, there's no outside and inside. From God's point of view, everything is only one. So yes, of course, we can get uh, help from, uh, from God, no doubt, if we view it in this way. But uh, we have to understand the God we are praying to, who will help us, is the same God within everything. Now, are there some examples? Again, I take the example of Arjun. Arjun seeks the help of God. He takes on Krishna. Can you please help me? And Krishna's help that he gives is to teach him about the interiority of the same God. That this God is inside everything. And the first thing he teaches is that that God is fundamentally you, not just inside. That God is you at the most fundamental level. Away from body, away from mind, that fundamental entity, that is it. And because of that, you can never be harmed. So I think we have to, with the advanced understanding of these matters, we have to employ every technique. And if we can talk to God as an intimate friend, won't you help me here, please? Yes, of course, that's all good. But then part of that help would be the response, if you listen carefully to that supreme helper, the first piece of internal advice you get is, see God in the other person. I am there. Lord, will you help me? Yes. Did you see me dressed up like this? You want my guidance and help? Wonderful. Change your point of view so that you see me not just beside you or not just in a church, but also in your own interior, in meditation and outside meditation in the other person. In the other person, in the other place, in the other event, in the other situation. That's how we do it. Is that okay? Yes, okay, thank you. Thank you. You see, from a devotional point of view, if that is our most, our nearest and dearest, our most beloved, naturally we'll talk and express all our difficulties and feelings. From a devotee point of view, we can do that. The beauty of Bhagavad Vedanta is it gives us a wider range of tools. We, there is scope for that. There's also scope for our seeing the interconnectedness of things. And there's also scope for seeing the absolute nature of things, all of these three. And we can use them all and shift our view because if your car breaks down, you won't use all the tools. You'll only use the tool that is appropriate for the problem. 
So we have all these tools supplied to us. And the multi-purpose tool, the final tool that will serve every purpose would be the non-dualistic tool. Seeing that entity in everything and as everything. Does that all make sense? You see all this uh, because we are not accustomed to thinking in these ways. We need all the tools available to persuade the emotional side that we have around to the principles. We have to rally around the feelings to be compatible with the thinkings the principles. First we understand the principles and then we understand the practice and employ the practice. Principles without practice is hollow and practice without the principles has no motivation in it, no reasoning, no rationale behind it, blind faith. So we use the principles, we reconcile the feelings with the principles, like that. One remark, uh, just, um, is it really possible to see God in others if we don't see him in, in us? No. Yeah, because it's difficult. But you see, the, the opportunities to do both are presented both so sitting with a prayer, meditation, japa, this is the opportunity to see this in us. But we don't apply that when we're in the world. When we're dealing with other people and situations, we then have the opportunity to see that principle in others. And it's the principle of the withinness that we have to understand and incorporate and absorb. This withinness. That's the principle. If you were to say, what is the principle? It's the withinness of everything. Sitting by yourself, the withinness in you. Sitting with others, the witness, withinness in, in them. That stimulates then love and service. Your attitude of love will create love back. So there are some examples in my own life I, I can give, of course, and I may have given them before. I have come across some very, very dangerous situations and my approach is purely from philosophy because having no fear if i understand god is there then the fear is gone and i can approach that situation walk towards it not away from it walk directly into what other people consider the danger zone walk right in right into the fray knowing that i have the full armor of god on me so if I am not confident that God is with me constantly, has invested life in me for a purpose, and if I'm attuned to that and aligned to that, then what is there to fear? Then if I see it on the other side, so-called, there's no other side there. There's only one. So this oneness is there. So uh, that's the answer, yes. We have to cultivate both things. We have to cultivate the withinness of things. From the withinness here to the withinness everywhere. Um, I think I mentioned this uh, before, uh, and I keep like kind of having the same situation which is sometimes when when I get asked about something um, from knowledge and I get asked to share it with other people 
I keep having that, um, I don't know if it's a thought, a feeling. It's, um, it's a sentiment inside me that kind of stops me from doing it. I feel very pushed back because I keep feeling that although I am conscious I've got some experiences I could share because that's my experience and it might be helpful to other people. I keep feeling that I don't know to share. And can I, then, ask, can I ask who's who's asking you to share? Yes. So for example, um there was a group at work um that they wanted to kind of share more about mental health and difficult situations that then lead into something greater and and so on and and i got asked why don't you create a series of um videos maybe with your art that you can share how to actually get something beautiful from a difficult situation and Although it's something I always thought I would love to do, I feel stopped because I keep feeling that I don't know enough or I, mm, who am I to share that? It's like this, this phrase from, uh, I think it was Socrates of, the only thing I know is that I know nothing. <laughs> what am I going to share? So okay. I don't know how to either understand what is going on inside me that is creating that or how to overcome it if I need to overcome okay, it. So, so you see, when we're in tu attuned to the divine will, you see, thy will be done. When we're attuned to the divine will, then we simply follow the inner guidance which is there. And how can we test it? we have to probably wait for multiple what I call green lights, opportunities which are there, which say this way, there's no other alternative, go this way, go this way, they go this way. It's listening to the inner voice of wisdom and simply doing that, carrying out the divine will, putting yourself in an instrumental place where you become an open channel for divine grace to flow and to flow to others. And it comes in with, with my skills and talents and so on and so forth, which are not mine, but God given, what will I do with them for the benefit of everyone? And is it the right thing to do? And is it the timely thing to do? Uh, so uh, if the workplace are trying to deal with some kind of issues like that, and it's not relevant to the work itself, then perhaps it's outside their scope to deal with those things in the first place because these things may well be private things. But if on your own volition, you decide, okay, I have a certain inspiration and I can do this. And now there are the clues I can pick up to say, yes, this is what you should be doing. Then you formulate a thought and you formulate a visualization of it and you allow that to unfold. So, yes. How do you create the thought, Swami? Do you... Nobody creates, nobody, creates, nobody, you creates, nobody creates a thought. A thought arrives. A noble thought, nobody creates, it arrives. And is recognized as an internal inspiration. The inner voice of God. Go on, my child. Then you listen again and again, and you wait for the other factors to come in. Supposing I have the thought, let me make a garden. Let me make a public park where people can enjoy flowers and get a certain sense of peace. For example, you know, where, I, where we go on retreat, Landemir or something. Let me do that. 
then I do make a move toward it. I maybe see if there's a property somewhere. Then if it comes easily and naturally, that's a clear indication. Other things will come. If without any effort, something comes in, with a little bit of effort, a lot of other things will come in. Then you have somebody who says, oh, I'm a landscape artist. Okay. You buy into my vision? Yes, I like your vision a lot. Okay, fine. And when you use those words, my, my, your vision, my vision, and so on and so forth, secretly you're saying, actually, it's the Lord's inspiration coming to me. And I'm carrying out his will, and he will then manifest it and provide all the ingredients necessary. And they may come in the form of volunteers or uh, expertise, and finances come, and so on and so forth. And then the public comes, and the publicity comes, and all that comes. And after 10 years, everybody's enjoying a well-established garden that is designed to be there for the next thousand years. We succeed is succeed, succeeding people, succeeding generations as gardeners and people who maintain your garden. It requires the art of listening to that still inner voice and saying, oh, a thought has arrived. Where has it come from? You see, we have that expression, it came to me, it struck me. Well, I think we're done. We've done our... Thank you, Swami. Oh, Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Peace, peace, peace be on all. Thank you, Swami. Thank you. Thank you, Swamiji. Thank you, Swamiji. Thank you, Swamiji. Thank you, Swamiji. Oh.